Hi, and welcome to the workshop titled Getting Your Kids Out of the Homeschool Bubble. Listen, I and my wife have been homeschooling for, well, actually she did all the homeschooling, <laughs> but we've been in the homeschool environment for about 20 years. Uh, she homeschooled all of our four children, uh, Luke, Elise, Abby, and Hunter. And uh, we've gotten them out of the bubble, at least we've tried to do that. We're gonna give you very practical examples of what we've done. But before that, we want to do set a theological foundation for what this is all about. And so we're asking, what is the homeschool bubble? It's, it's somehow keeping them protected, certain group of friends, make sure nothing bad happens to them, uh, various ways that you can put it. But it's, it's a high form of protecting our kids, which is not bad at all. But it can get overdone. You're going to find out why in just a little bit. Uh, and I want to challenge you, though. Probably when I've given this seminar many times, people walked away saying, that's had, I had no idea that's what we were going to talk about, but that was wonderful. That was phenomenal. I want to challenge you that the homeschool bubble stems from what I call cat theology. This bubble is found in cat theology. Cat theology asks one very simple question, and that question is this. Who did Christ primarily die for? Who did Christ primarily die for? The key word there is primarily. Well, I, what do you mean primarily? He died for me. He died for anything else? Well, that's the question. Did Jesus die primarily for our sins or was there something else? In Colossians chapter 1, 19 and 20, we read these words. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by blood on his cross. All things. Wait a second. Things? Christ died for things? What are things? Well, like plants and trees and animals and rocks and mountains and hills and water and the animals in the water. He died for that? Huh. And things in heaven? What are things in heaven? Well, like planets and moons and asteroids and comets and solar systems and galaxies. Why would Christ die for those? Well, in Genesis 3, we found there were four curses. Number one, the snake had to crawl. Two, women had pain and childbirth. Three, men had trouble toiling the cellar. And four, cursed is the ground because of you. Cursed is the ground. What does it mean the ground is cursed? I want to challenge you that that means the plants and the uh, that animals that Adam and Eve saw before they sinned were far different, far more glorious than what they are today. What we see today is a stained, cursed version. Paul agrees with this in Romans 8. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom, the glory of the children of God. Bondage to decay. What does that mean? It means everything around us is in a state of decay. Now, if you're 30 years of age and younger, you have no idea what I'm talking about. You think you're going to live forever. I did too. I used to go out and run four miles during college. No problem. Today, can't do that. My shoulder hurts. My leg hurts. I've got plantar fasciitis. I'm getting old. It's not just that I'm getting old, it's that my body is decaying. My body's in a state of decay. It was made from the ground, that ground was cursed. It's in a state of decay, my body's in a state of decay. It won't happen that way in heaven. In heaven, our bodies won't decay. We'll have a new body that'll last forever. Hence, I'm challenging you, what Adam and Eve saw before the fall, the plants, the trees, the grass, all of that was far more glorious than what we see now. No wonder it says in Psalm 145 these words. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. The Lord has compassion on all, I mean all people? He, no, all he has made. God has compassion on the frogs? Yeah. The giraffes? Yeah. The trees, the grass, the sunset? Yeah. God has compassion on that. Why? Because they're in a state of cursedness. He wants to restore them back to their original state. 
Hence, Christ died for us. Yes, we know that. Things on earth. Yes, we know that. Things in heaven. Hey, is there anything else that he died for? And if so, which one is primary? That's the question that we're asking. Which one is primary? In order to get our kids out of the homeschool bubble, we've got to see which one is primary. Romans 15, 8, 9, he says this. Paul talks about another reason why Christ came. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the Jews on behalf of God's truth in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs so that, so that, there's a reason, so that the Gentiles, non-Jewish people, if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile, welcome to the Gentile club, so that the Gentiles might not go to hell. Hey, I didn't think it said that. That's not what it says. But you'd think it would say it, but that's not what it says. What does it say? So that the Gentiles may what? Glorify God for his mercy. The Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. You and I were saved for a purpose. We were saved to bring our Father glory. That's why we're here on this earth. So that gives us a fourth reason Christ came for us. We know that things on earth, yes, things in heaven, he came for the glory of God. Again, we have to ask the same question. Which one is primary? Which one is primary. Well, how do we find that out? Well, we find out probably by asking Jesus. Let's look to Jesus. He's the one that died on the cross. He probably would give us a hint at it. In John chapter 12, Jesus is one day away from the cross. He's with his disciples up at the, in the uh, uh, Passover festival in Jerusalem, and he's opening up his heart to his disciples. We catch a glimpse of his heart. As we catch a glimpse of his heart, he's basically telling his disciples, guys, I don't want to do this. This is going to be painful. This is going to hurt. I really don't want to do this. And he says these words. Now my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. He's saying, I don't want to do it, but I've got to. It's the whole reason I came. And then the very first word of verse 28 is huge. Don't miss it. It's so easy to go by, so easy to pass over, but don't miss it. Here's the word. Father. Father. Why is that word so huge? Huge. Because he's done talking to his disciples, he's now addressing his heavenly Father. As he's addressing his heavenly Father, he's probably going to be talking very much heart to heart about what the whole thing is about. Now remember, he's one day away from the cross, dying, not because of the nails in the hand, not because of the nail between the two feet, rather hanging there for hours, his muscles get paralyzed, and he slowly suffocates to death. One of the worst deaths any human can endure, that's why it was internationally outlawed and banned, uh, and so he's about to die this death. He's about to talk to his heavenly father. Let me ask you this question. It's very key. It's very key to help you understand the bubble. You ready? Do you think he's going to talk to his heavenly father about the primary reason for why he's going to the cross or a secondary reason for why he's going to the cross? I probably would say primary, and I think you're agreeing. Most of my audiences do primary. So what does he say? Well, let's ask this. What does he not say? Notice he didn't say, Father, Save these kind, wonderful, worthy people from hell. They don't deserve it. Doesn't say that. What does it say? Father, glorify thy name. Restore the glory to the trees, to the flowers, to the plants, to the animals, to the fish, to the sea, to the rocks, to the hills. Let your glory shine the way it was originally designed to be. So Jesus died for things on earth, yes, things in heaven, yes. He died for us, yes. He died for the Father's glory. He seems to communicate his Father's glory is the higher priority. Depending upon who Christ primarily died for, you'll have two totally different types of theology. We call them cat and dog theology. Now, I love my dog and my cat. This is our dog, Jasmine. She's a white mixed lab. Everybody loves her. Here's our cat, Simba. Everybody loves Simba, okay? But they're very, very different. Cats and dogs are different. You know that. So there's a joke about their mindsets. A dog says, you pet me, you feed me, you shelter me, you love me. Oh, you must be God. Whereas a cat says the exact same thing. You pet me, you feed me, you shelter me, you love me. Oh, I must be God. That joke characterizes Christian theology around the world today. Cats say, it's all about us, baby. God did all of this for us. Now, here's how a cat thinks. This is why a cat gets to this place. Here's how a cat thinks. A cat thinks, listen, Jesus left the Father's glory for me. 
He suffered for me. He died for me. He's coming back to heaven. For, he's gone back to heaven to build a mansion for me. He's up there interceding for me. And he's coming back a second time for me. Gee, I wonder who God lives for. He must live for me. And if God lives for me, and I want to be like God, uh, Ephesians 5, 1 says, be an imitator of God. If God lives for me and I'm supposed to imitate God, I'm going to live for me too. And so as a result, I do it in a Christian context. And if God lives for me, then fill in the blank. My friends, my siblings, my youth group, my parents, it, they should all live for me too. And that's why we have some kids who can be found at the center of the universe. Even though they're Christian, they go to church, they go to Sunday school, they do all those things, but deep down inside, they think it's all about them. And as a result, they've missed so much. A dog thinks very differently. A dog says, cat, you missed it. Jesus left the Father's glory to glorify his Father. He suffered to glorify his Father. He died to glorify his Father. He's gone back to heaven to build us a mansion to glorify his Father. He's up there interceding for us to glorify his Father, and he's coming back a second time to glorify his Father. Dogs know it's all about the glory of God. And if God lives for God, then fill in the blanks. We all should be living for the glory of God. In every person, you're going to find cat attitudes and dog attitudes. They're in all of us. We all have an old nature. We all have a new nature. Okay, I want to go over four practical differences these two mindsets create. I'm going to be looking at extremes. Most of us fall somewhere right here in the middle. Okay, we're going to look at extremes. But let's go over number one. Two different primary reasons for Christ's death results in two motivations for getting to heaven. Cats, you see, walk away from hell. If hell is over there and heaven is over there, here's how a cat gets to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. No, I don't want to go to hell. No. No, I don't want to go to hell. No. They find out they can say a prayer, they add some faith to it, and they say, praise God, I'm not going to hell. And all the time they were focused on themselves. They got to heaven focused on themselves. Dogs get to heaven very differently. Dogs aren't walking away from hell, they're walking toward heaven. They found someone who's so beautiful, he's beauty. Who's so glorious, he's glory. Who's so powerful, he's almighty. And they say, like my son Hunter said many years ago, I found God. And let me ask you a question. If your students, your kids are focused on themselves, what kind of dreams will they dream for their future? And will that keep them in the bubble? Yes. It's going to keep them dreaming dreams that keep them safe and comfortable and protected because it's all about them. And as a result, they're never going to want to go outside the bubble because they've learned how comfortable the bubble is and how it's protective. How about another difference? Quiet times. Cats and dogs both have quiet times. They both look to God. They both want God. They're both seeking God. But their quiet times look a little bit different. Here's what a dog is thinking during a dog's quiet time. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. Where's the glory of God shining in my, in my work at the office? Where's the glory of shining in how I do my housework? Where's the glory of God shining in, in how I keep my lawn? Where's the glory of God shining in the government shutdowns? Where's the God, glory of God shining in world politics, in, in China, Iran, Iraq, all those areas, Russia? Where is God's glory shining? That's first and foremost with a dog. Well, cats have quiet times too, but... Their focus is just a little bit different. I'm talking about me. My, me. Oh, I love having quiet I'm times. About me. I love being the center of your attention, God. Oh, yeah, Lord. Pet me here. Oh, yeah, God. Yeah, yeah, that's oh, yeah, right. God. Scratch oh, me right there. Yeah. Yeah. I love this song. And God, here's a list of how you can best bless I want this me. and this and then and I'll this. tell you how I, I want to serve, serve you, God. Nothing hard, of course. I don't do Just stuff the easy God. stuff. Your glory? What? Why? Why? No, no, later, Lord. Let's get back to my list first. It's about me, God. What I like, what I want, don't really care what you want. 
When a cat has a quiet time, a cat is focused solely on its self. What it wants, what it needs. They seek God not for who he is, but for what he can give them. Listen, how will your kids' quiet times affect their bubble? How will their quiet times affect their bubble? It'll probably keep them right smack dab in the bubble. What about in the area of worship? Let's look, look at another difference in the area of worship. Both cats and dogs worship. But in dog theology, a dog's worship, dogs worship God primarily for who he is, secondarily for what he has done for them. Primarily for who he is, secondarily what he has done for them. To a dog, songs like How Great Thou Art, indescribable, very common, very familiar, because they exalt God for his character, for who he is. In cat theology, that's reversed. Cats worship God primarily for who he, or what he has done for us, secondarily for who he is. Primarily for what he's done for us, secondarily for who he is. And so a lot of their favorite songs have the three words, me, my, and I, all in them. And without realizing it, the focus is still on them. Cats are singing about themselves in a Christian context. So if they are focused on themselves, how will their worship affect their goals? And how will it keep them in the bubble? Well, if they're primarily worshiping themselves, they're never going to get outside of that bubble. They're never going to want to do anything else. Let's go to the next one, a harder one. Lordship. Cats and dogs have different areas of lordship, okay? A cat uh, has a clipboard, and on that clipboard it says, Lord, here's how I want to serve you. I want to do this, 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 and this. I want to serve you this way. Please sign down here. And so they've drawn what we call lines in the sand. For parents, the line in the sand says, I said you can have everything, but don't touch my kids. That's what a lot of parents are saying. God, you know, you can have everything, but don't touch my kids. You can't mess with them. No, I'm here to protect them, and I don't want you messing them up, as if we love our kids more than God. And so when it comes to a cat's lordship, here's what a cat is singing in a cat's lordship. And that's their lordship is limited without realizing they've lost the lordship of Christ. It's limited. I'll, I'll surrender you to a point. If you ask me to do difficult things, I'm not going to go. Whereas a dog has a totally different clipboard. A dog has a blank sheet of paper and they've already signed it at the bottom. Whatever you want me to do, I've already committed to obeying. Hence in our cartoon book, the dog says, my wife, my life, my wife, my kids, whatever pleases you, use us for your glory. So let me ask you, if your kids have a lordship that is limited, will they ever fully know God's will for their lives? And will it keep them stuck in the bubble? Whereas dogs study theology, cats study meology. You all know that. Your greatest threat to successful homeschooling is lukewarm Christianity. It's not the Muslims. It's not the Buddhists. It's not uh, uh, the atheists of the world. It's not our political environment. It's lukewarm Christianity. And I want to challenge you that cat theology, lukewarm theology, cat theology is keeping them in the bubble. Now, I'm going to switch slides real quickly so you can get the other side of this bubble story. If everything is about bringing God his glory, we need to ask the question, how much glory do we want to give to God? Do we want to give him some glory? Do we want to give him a lot of glory? tremendous glory, or do we want to bring God maximum glory? I would hope and pray that you're committed to bringing God maximum glory. So how do we do that? How do we bring God the greatest glory he could ever have corporately as the planet Earth, humans on this planet Earth? Well, I want to challenge you. This has everything to do with world evangelization. When we ask a very different question, and that question is this, what does God get out of that? 
What does God get out of world evangelization? What does God get when there are people from every tongue, every tribe, every nation worshiping him? Well, in order to answer that, let me ask you another question. What happens to your vision of God when you worship God with people from other cultures? What happens to your vision of God when you worship God with people from other cultures? I've asked this hundreds of times to my audiences, thousands of times. I always get the same answer. Their vision of God gets greater. It gets bigger. That's right. And there's a principle found in there. God reveals greater glory by unifying that which is diverse. God reveals greater glory by unifying that which is diverse. If you take uh, an ISIS soldier and an Israeli soldier, lead them to the Lord, disciple them to the point where they put down their guns and they come together arm in arm, they stand in awe of God. Everybody around them stands in awe of God and God gets tremendous glory. Take a Hindu from the highest class and a Hindu from the lowest, the untouchable class, where this person won't even touch this person. Lead them to Christ, disciple them, help them come together and go arm in arm for the first time. God gets even more glory. Put them with the ISIS soldiers, even more glory. You get the idea, when more diversity is united, more of God's glory is revealed. If you understand that principle, I want to challenge you. This is why Jesus said, I want people from every tongue, every tribe, and every nation. Every tongue, every tribe, and every nation. Why? When you and I are there with people from every tongue, tribe, and nation, he'll not only get glory as if he'd reached the Jews only. He'll not only get greater glory as if he'd reached the Jews and a few Gentile groups. When you and I are there with people from every tongue, every tribe, and every nation, then and only then will our God get the greatest glory he could ever have from mankind. The greatest glory will come to our Father when you and I are there with worshiping him with every tongue, tribe, and every nation. This, I want to challenge you, is the story of the Bible. Now, I'm not talking about Bible stories. You all know Bible stories. David and Goliath, Daniel lines, then the ten plagues. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about one overall story that has an introduction, a story, and a conclusion. An introduction, Genesis 1 to 11, the Tower of Babel, the story promised to Abraham, and a conclusion. Let's go through it very quickly. Genesis chapter 1 to 11 is the introduction. God says, hey, let there be light. The story goes from Genesis 12 to Revelation 4, and the conclusion is Revelation 5 to the very end. You all know the very basics to the introduction. God creates mankind. Mankind falls into sin. God takes care of the sin. Mankind begins to grow and multiply, and then every intention of man's heart is evil. God, being a holy God, could not put up with all that sin. Sin can reach a point where God says, that's it, I'm judging. And God judged. He brought about Noah and his ark. Forty days and forty nights it rains. A year later they crash. After they crash, God gives them a rainbow and says, Noah, I am never going to do that again on the face of the earth. Then, after mankind grows and multiplies more, still in rebellion, still one people, God says, I'm going to do in one moment what should have taken centuries to do. He took their one language and he broke it down into many different languages. Approximately 70, if you count them up, 70 different linguist, linguistic groups there at the Tower of Babel. And that ends the introduction to the story of the Bible. If we were watching this at a theater, the curtains would close at this point in time. We'd go out, get some Coke and popcorn, uh, put it all down, come back in, and we would begin the story of the Bible. In the beginning of the story of the Bible, God reaches down and picks up one man and he says to that one man, look, Abe, buddy, I want to bless you. In fact, I want to bless your socks off. I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. I want to pour out my grace, my mercy, my love upon you. And the reason I want to bless you, Abraham, is not that you can simply sit back and say, oh, praise the Lord, I've been blessed. No, that's part of it. That's not all of it. I also want you to turn around and be a blessing to all the other people groups on the face of the earth. I have blessed you to be a blessing to others. We find this in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. It's called the Abrahamic covenant or the Abrahamic promise. He says these words, I'll make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. This covenant, you can find some theologians who will break it down into five parts, some into four, some into three. We want to suggest two. Two very simple, basic parts. Why? There are nearly 400 paraphrases or abridgments of it throughout the Word of God. Two basic components. One is that God wants to bless us. We call them top-line blessings. God is a God who wants to bless. 
Bless us with homes, families, friends, times, bank accounts, careers, all of these things. But they're never solely for us. Never are the blessings solely for us. God sees through us to others. He wants us to turn around and to be a blessing, to be a blessing to others. But where specifically others? Where do these blessings go? Well, I use a very specific word, and through you all, peoples, P-E-O-P-L-E-S. That is not a typo on the screen. That's an actual word that refers to distinct groups of people that call us, us, and the others, them. And because he used the one little word, all, through you, Abram, all peoples on earth shall be blessed. What we've got here in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, is for all practical purposes, the great commission. The great commission. Wait, I thought Jesus gave the great commission. No. Jesus never initiated the idea of all, reaching all nations. It begins here in Genesis chapter 12, 2 and 3, and it makes the entire Word of God one book with one story. So don't miss the big picture. What's the big picture? God wants to use people. He wants to use you. He wants to use me to reach nations. He wants to use your children to reach nations. This gets them out of the bubble. It gets them out of the bubble. In fact, the Abrahamic Covenant forms a foundation for a story that runs the entire way through the scriptures, like I said, of railroad tracks. One rail the top line, one rail the bottom line, one rail going in the distance begins to form one story. Well, let's go to the conclusion. Let's see how the story ends. Let's peek in the back of the book and find out. In Revelation 5, 9, we read these words. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for God from just about every tribe and language and people and nation. Is that what it says? No. What's it say? From every tribe, language, people, and nation. That means what God set out to do in the very beginning of the Bible. Remember we saw it as one book, one story, one thing. What he set out to do here in a promise, he fulfills at the very end. And everything in between is a story. He makes a promise, he fulfills that promise, and it's the story of the Bible. How foundational and significant is the story of the Bible? Now maybe you'll understand the words of Jesus as he said this, Matthew 24, verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. There's that allness factor again, every ethnic group. And then the end will come. And then the end will come. Listen, I thought as a Christian, when I came to know Christ, nobody knew when Christ was going to come back, not even Jesus, just only God the Father. So we're just supposed to be good people, twiddle our thumbs, and kind of wait around until Jesus comes back. Probably he's not going to happen in our lifetime, so just live a good life, be a nice person. No. Uh-uh. He said, the end is not going to come. History as we know it will not come until all nations are reached. Why? Why is God not going to come back? Why is he not going to send his son Jesus back until all nations reach? Two reasons. Number one, if he did come back without 13, two, one group of people being reached, he would have broken a promise to Abraham and he'd be called a liar for all of eternity. Not, allowed, not going to allow that to happen. Secondly, far more importantly, he would not reveal his greatest glory and that's what it's been about from the beginning. Hey, if your students don't know the story of the Bible, how will it affect their bubble? It's going to keep them inside their bubble. So listen, this is what my wife and I have done. <clears throat> we have tried to get our kids out of the bubble. We've done a couple of practical things. Now, here are the practical suggestions here. Number one, we've created a family theme. We're blessed to be a blessing. We've been blessed to be a blessing. So our kids knew that. We've been blessed to be a blessing, kids. Abrahamic covenant, that's what it's all about. God has blessed us to turn around and to be a blessing. Here's some of the creative ways we try to build it into them. <clears throat> in the mornings, when they would breakfast, they're, um, <clears throat> they would eat breakfast on a uh, mat, <clears throat> but it was a world map that was uh, laminated. <clears throat> and after breakfast, we'd have little races. Okay, who can find Africa first? Who can find Asia first? Who can find uh, uh, Central America first? And then we go into who can find Colombia first? Who can find Kazakhstan? And we got detail with them. 
our kids grew up with a vision for the world. We also got them great books. If you've ever done the Heroes Then and Now by YWAM, phenomenal. Get those books. I heard good news today. There are three of them. Excellent books to give your kids a vision for what God is doing among the nations and how God is using missionaries. Well, we went from serial placemats, blessed to be blessing serial placemats, to reading them stories. Then we started getting them involved. My wife got them going and teaching other homeschool kids. This is my daughter, obviously, very uh, in her, uh, 13, 14, 15, teaching young kids. So we took them to other homeschool co-ops, and our kids got out there started teaching the kids. This is where my oldest daughter began to say, I want to be a teacher, because she began to do this. Later, we did free car washes. Have you ever learned from Steve Shogren? We did uh, practice servant evangelism. We do free car washes. Free car wash. You put up four signs. No Free car wash, free Coke, or free sodas, no donations, no kidding. And so we'd have them hold up those four signs. Then we'd go wash cars. People would say, why are you doing this? Here, let me give you some money. No, 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 we won't accept money. Why are you doing this? We just want to make God look good. We're here to make God famous. And so we did that. And then from there, we began to go into the inner city. And we began to go in the inner city and we began to tutor the kids. Now listen, it's not safe in the inner city. I know that. And where we went was one of the uh, highest crime rates in the state and almost in the United States. But we still went in the daytime anyway, and our kids got a love for other kids. <clears throat> Some of you might be saying, but they'll hear swear words. Yes, they will. They'll hear swear words from little kids. Let me tell you how to get over that problem. Here's what I did with my kids. I taught them all the swear words first. So I taught our kids the swear words. And then I ranked them. I had taught them and we were out swimming once and my son said, Dad, how come your coworker says shut up? My wife doesn't like the word shut up, so it kind of got into that category. And so I said, great question. Let me rank them for you. So I began to rank them. And he, after that, he said, that was so helpful. It was helpful to realize that there are different rankings in the square ones. Another thing that we did was getting to know international students. We had international students. We would go camping with them. We'd do hiking with them. We had a blast with them uh, and just got our kids involved. And they got to meet with international students. Also, on the major holidays, we had lots of people over to our homes. Uh, this gentleman was from uh, Saudi Arabia. This guy was from France. And just letting him into our home, giving our kids a vision. And then we took a family missions trip. We went and got out of our comfort zone as a family. We went on a mission trip. It was expensive, yes, but we did it because we wanted to get our kids outside of their bubble. As they got older, they went on a gap year. Both of our daughters went on a gap year, one to Africa, one to the Middle East. Uh, and so it was great to take them over there. And now what we do as homeschoolers reading with Cat and Dog Theology is we take homeschoolers to teach Cat and Dog Theology in Africa. And so you are welcome to join us and to go to Africa and to teach cat and dog theology. We do it once a year. Uh, check out our website on that. So let me switch back to the last uh, few moments of our workshop. We have curriculum for your kids. Curriculum to get them out of the bubble. Curriculum to get them a vision. All of our material is laced with missions uh, to give their, their kids a vision of what God is doing among the globe. Uh, we have Kindergarten, we've got cartoon books that they're coloring, practical everyday scenarios. I heard good news today, 93 short stories. They get a vision of what God's doing around the globe. They have other missionary stories. You've got a parent's guidebook with the whole thing. Excellent, excellent way for kindergartners. Kids just love it. Elementary year one, cat and dog attitudes, living to make God famous. We say, kids, you're on this earth to make God famous. How can you do it? By obeying your parents, respecting adults, loving your siblings, loving others. Oh, is that how I make God famous? Yes. You've got a parent's guidebook. You've got a Heard Good News Today too. Brand new stories there. Another cartoon book. And with that, a third car uh, another cartoon book on top of that third one. And then audio files for them to listen to about the glory of God. Also, we have Cat and Dog Rewards. Helping kids see the difference between grace versus works. Mr. Kingsley's Big Surprise. Kids love that book. Helps them to see the difference. 103 Cat and Dog Choices and Randy Alcorn's Parents or Heaven for Kids. The Dog Walk Middle School Curriculum by my wife uh, developed. Uh, I Heard Good News Today 3 and uh, Emma Story. This Dog Walk is designed for your kids to learn the basics of what it means to walk with God. Phenomenal. Learning quiet times, how to study the Bible. It's excellent. 
comes with how to share their faith and, and the positive dog that they read. Finally, year one of high school, cat and dog theology, cat and dog prayer. They work through a 500-page workbook. There's an answer key to it, and they have to teach what they're learning to other people. Also, uh, the year two is the story of the Bible. What you just went over in that second half, the story of the Bible, God's bottom line, it's right there. Uh, cat and dog look at the cross. And then RG3, uh, which is the whole workbook revealing God's greatest glory. Here's a workbook, the answer key, and they have to teach that. Year three of the high school, living for eternity, uh, grace versus works. What's the difference between that? The book, Why? Why did God create anything? Finally, Randy Alcorn's book, The Law of Rewards. And again, they have to teach it. And then finally, number four, Heaven by Randy Alcorn, Heaven Wins by Don Richardson, and the CD where they have to teach it. I hope this has been helpful for you. I hope you now caught a vision of how to get your children out of the bubble. It's not going to be easy. Because you've got to take a step of faith because most of us parents are in the same bubble that our kids are in. Well, I hope this has been challenging for you. Please get our curriculum, check us out. May God give you wisdom as you go through the rest of this convention. Thanks.